During the Great Depression, John Herbert Dillinger led the Dillinger Gang, which was accused of robbing 24 banks and four police stations. Dillinger was wounded after evading police in four states for nearly a year and went to his father's house to recover. In July 1934, he returned to Chicago and sought refuge in a brothel run by Anna Kampanas, who later informed authorities of his whereabouts. Local and federal law enforcement officers converged on the Biograph Theater on July 22, 1934. When Bureau of Investigation agents approached Dillinger as he exited the theater, he attempted to flee. Before we continue, welcome back. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe now to the Past Crimes channel and don't forget to hit the like button below. John Dillinger was born on June 22, 1903, in Indianapolis, Indiana, as the younger of two children to John Wilson Dillinger and Mary Ellen Lancaster. Dillinger was frequently in trouble as a teenager for fighting and petty theft. He was also known for his bewildering personality and bullying of younger children. He dropped out of college to work in an Indianapolis machine shop. His father feared that the city would corrupt his son, so he relocated the family to Mooresville, Indiana, in 1921. Despite his new rural life, Dillinger's wild and rebellious behavior remained unchanged. He was arrested for auto theft in 1922, and his relationship with his father soured. Dillinger's troubles prompted him to enlist in the United States Navy in 1923, where he was assigned as a petty officer third-class machinery repairman aboard the battleship USS Utah, but he deserted a few months later while his ship was docked in Boston. Some months later, he was dishonorably discharged. Dillinger went back to Mooresville and met Beryl Ethel Hovius. On April 12, 1924, the two married. He tried to settle down, but he was unable to find work, so he began plotting a robbery with his ex-convict friend, Ed Singleton. The two robbed a nearby grocery store and stole $50. The criminals were spotted leaving the scene by a minister, who recognized them and reported them to the police. During the robbery, Dillinger struck a victim on the head with a machine bolt wrapped in a cloth and carried a gun that discharged but did not hit anyone. The two men were arrested the following day. Singleton pleaded not guilty, but after discussing the case with Morgan County Prosecutor Omar O'Hara, Dillinger's father persuaded him to confess to the crime and plead guilty without retaining a defense attorney. Dillinger was found guilty of robbery and assault and battery with intent to rob. As a result of his father's conversation with O'Hara, he expected a lenient probation sentence, but instead was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison for his crimes. His father regretted giving the advice and was shocked by the sentence. He begged the judge to reduce his sentence, but he was unsuccessful. Dillinger escaped his captors on the way to Mooresville to testify against Singleton, but was apprehended within minutes. Singleton's trial was moved, and he was sentenced to 2 to 14 years in prison. He passed away on September 2, 1937. Dillinger became involved in a criminal lifestyle while imprisoned at Indiana Reformatory and Indiana State Prison from 1924 to 1933. He was quoted as saying upon his admission to prison, I will be the meanest bastard you ever saw when I get out of here. Because of his long prison sentence, he became resentful of society and befriended other criminals, including seasoned bank robbers Harry Pete Pierpont, Charles McAuley, Russell Clark, and Homer Van Meter, who taught Dillinger how to be a successful criminal. Dillinger also studied and used Herman Lamb's meticulous bank robbing system throughout his criminal career. Dillinger's father organized a campaign to have him released and received 188 signatures on a petition. Dillinger was paroled on May 10, 1933, after serving nine and a half years. With little chance of finding work after being released at the height of the Great Depression, Dillinger immediately returned to crime. Dillinger is known to have participated with the Dillinger gang in 12 separate bank robberies between June 21st, 1933 and June 30, 1934. 
but we will need to discuss the Dillinger Gang's bank robberies in an entirely different video. Evelyn Frechette, known as Billy, first met John Dillinger in October 1933, and the couple began a relationship in the following month. Dillinger and his gang were apprehended in Tucson, Arizona on January 25, 1934. He was extradited to Indiana and escorted back by Indiana State Police Chief Matt Leach. Dillinger was taken to the Lake County Jail in Crown Point, Indiana, and imprisoned to face charges for the murder of a police officer who was killed on January 15, 1934, during a Dillinger gang bank robbery in East Chicago, Indiana. Local police boasted to local newspapers that the jail was escape-proof and that extra guards had been stationed as a precaution. However, during morning exercises with 15 other inmates on Saturday, March 3, 1934, Dillinger produced a wooden pistol, catching deputies and guards off guard, and he was able to leave the premises without firing a shot. A grand jury indicted Dillinger, and the Bureau of Investigation launched a nationwide manhunt for him. Dillinger reunited with his girlfriend, Billy Frechette, just hours after escaping from the Lake County Jail. The two traveled to the Twin Cities and stayed at the Santa Monica Apartments, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for 15 days. After meeting John Red Hamilton, Dillinger formed a new gang with Babyface Nelson's gang, which included Nelson, Homer Van Meter, Tommy Carroll, and Eddie Green. The second gang robbed a bank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and the first national bank in Mason City, Iowa, a week later. Dillinger and Frechette moved into the Lincoln Court Apartments in St. Paul, Minnesota, on Tuesday, March 20, 1934, using the aliases Mr. and Mrs. Carl T. Hellman. Daisy Coffey, the landlord, went to the FBI St. Paul field office to file a report, including information about the couple's new Hudson sedan parked in the garage behind the apartments. The building was placed under surveillance by two agents, Rufus Coulter and Rusty Knowles, as a result of Coffey's tip. Coulter and Cummings knocked on apartment 303's door. Frechette responded by opening the door two to three inches and telling them to wait because she was not dressed. While the agents waited, Van Meter went to the third floor landing and Coulter followed. Van Meter opened fire on Coulter as he approached the lobby on the ground floor. Dillinger opened fire through the door with a Thompson submachine gun after hearing Van Meter firing at Coulter, sending Cummings fleeing for cover. Dillinger then took a step forward and fired another burst at Cummings. Cummings retaliated with a revolver, but he quickly ran out of ammunition. One of his five shots struck Dillinger in the left leg. Dillinger and Frechette dashed down the stairs, exited through the back door, and drove away in the Hudson after Cummings retreated. Dillinger and Billy visited Dillinger's father in Mooresville. Dillinger and his brother Hubert rear-ended a couple on the road on April 7th. Within hours, swarms of police arrived at the accident scene, only to find an empty car on the side of the road. Dillinger had a meeting at a tavern at 416 North State Street on Monday, April 9th. Billy went in first, sensing trouble. She was quickly apprehended by agents, but she refused to reveal Dillinger's location. Dillinger waited in his car outside the tavern before driving away unnoticed. She would never see Dillinger again. The Bureau received word on Sunday, April 22nd, that John Dillinger and several of his associates were hiding out at Little Bohemia, a small vacation lodge. When three men exited the building and began driving away, Special Agent in Charge Melvin Purvis and several BOI agents approached. Agents yelled for the car to come to a halt, but the driver did not hear them. Agents opened fire, killing the driver. Dillinger and his gang were upstairs in the lodge when they began shooting out the windows. While the BOI agents ducked for cover, Dillinger and his men escaped through the back door. Dillinger then relocated to Michigan's Upper Peninsula and then to Chicago, where he assumed the alias Jimmy Lawrence. The FBI had formed a Dillinger task force and dubbed him Public Enemy No. 1 by this point. They even found his abandoned car in the city. 
The FBI was aware he was in town, but the team was unable to find any leads for several months. In another attempt to elude law enforcement, Dillinger paid a plastic surgeon $5,000 to change his appearance near the end of May. His moles and scars were removed, his famous chin cleft was filled in, and his fingerprints were burned away. I don't look any different than I did before, he allegedly said while looking in the mirror. Rita Hamilton fled Fargo, North Dakota, as a teen. She met Anna Companas in Gary, Indiana, and worked as a prostitute in Anna's brothel on the side. In June 1934, Dillinger and Hamilton met at the Barrel of Fun nightclub, where he introduced himself as Jimmy Lawrence. Dillinger suggested to Hamilton on July 22nd that they go see a show at the Biograph Theater, which was just around the corner from their hideout. Dillinger had no idea Hamilton's madam, Anna Companas, a Romanian immigrant facing deportation for operating a brothel in Gary, Indiana, had betrayed him. Anna identified Dillinger from wanted posters. In order to reach an agreement, she told the FBI everything she knew about Dillinger's whereabouts. This enabled them to set up surveillance in the area where he was staying. The FBI task force surrounded the theater on the evening of July 22nd while Dillinger and Hamilton were watching the show. Purvis stood by the front door, lighting a cigar to signal Dillinger's departure. Dillinger turned his head and looked directly at the agent as he walked by, then glanced across the street, moved ahead of his female companions, and reached into his pocket, according to both he and the other agents. Three men pursued Dillinger into the alley and fired. Clarence Hurt shot twice, Charles Winstead three times, and Herman Hollis once. Dillinger was hit from behind and fell face first to the ground. According to a New York Times report the next day, Dillinger was shot and killed by special agents on July 22, 1934, around 10.40 p.m. Dillinger died only two months after fellow notorious criminals, Bonnie and Clyde. Thanks for watching, and make sure you have subscribed to the Past Crimes channel. Also, hit that bell icon so you can get notified when I upload the next video.